interlie, uh, you've been sent back into the ripcord AO, you had the fight near Hill 805 and left E2501 up there while you headed off patrolling. Uh, and so pick up the story okay. there. Well, we, <coughs> we passed the bomb craters where the Air Force dropped the Sunner 50 pound bombs on the target that got secondary explosions. Mm -hmm. Everybody's very happy about that. We came to a little hilltop that had a fresh bunker on it, fresh feces around the bunker. We did not dig in. We got up in the middle of the night. I heard something. Mm. Something alerted me. I said, we're not safe here. We moved out. We got about a thousand meters down, down range in the dark. Got light. Mortar rounds erupted mm -hmm. on the old NDP troops. Right. Were salmon. We were pretty lucky. I think that was about where we got to. Yeah, that's about where we got to. Uh, Some of the days now sort of run together, but, I'm, it, but, but there's some events that are their time stamped very, very well. Mm -hmm. On the uh, second platoon, I think I mentioned they got uh, some stray 155 rounds impacted near them, mm -hmm. got that cut off. Uh, it, it was just a sign of things getting a little bit confusing, a little bit tense. That they weren't tracking exactly where I was. Somebody fired into my area. And the areas weren't demarked precisely, but if you knew I was going down the valley, it, it was sort of an unwritten rule, don't don't shoot something near him. Mm -hmm. you know, so what's near me? So, but did, somebody decided to pull the trigger on shooting one five five. So this will be the this should be the 15th, and maybe it's the 16th, but we were finding underground kitchens. We're finding underground fighting positions. We're uncovering 51 caliber fighting positions dug in so that they really only looked at ripcord and you couldn't see them from other angles. Uh, we found an underground aid station. Uh, of course, Lucas had told me to look for graves. I'm looking for graves, so we're looking for things in the ground, and we keep finding things in the ground, but they're not graves. They're, mm -hmm. And we were carrying five gallon plastic jerry cans that were about a quarter full of persistent CS. And we'd wrap those with a couple of rounds of debt cord, we'd toss them in the bunkers, we'd set the fuse, they'd blow up. The idea was it would impregnate the, wall, the earthen walls of the, of the underground structures with persistent CS and make them unusable. I don't know how long that works, if it works at all. Mm -hmm. I guess if I wanted to get back underground and somebody was dropping bombs on me, persistent CS would be the least of my worries. But uh, nonetheless, we did that until we expended all that we were carrying. And at that point, I said, "Good, we don't have to do we don't have to do that anymore." <laughs> and the guys were saying the same thing. Yeah, okay, we don't have to carry that stuff. The platoons were still separate, where I separated them. Lee was working with 2nd platoon closer to Ripcord. I was hanging around with 3rd platoon because Noel wasn't there. Mm -hmm. they, they, I mean, they were essentially leaderless. Mm -hmm. And I sent Piesa farther down in the valley so he could get to work his men, learn them a little bit have his own sort of independent area of operation. I wasn't sort of sitting over his shoulder. But we weren't separated by more than three, four hundred meters mm -hmm. at any given time. The idea was I wanted to be able to get back together quickly in case something happened. Uh, the terrain down there is uneven. It's rocky, a lot of rocks, uh, moss-covered rocks. And where that wasn't, it was uh, the undergrowth and the jungle trees coming up hardwood, a lot of hardwoods. But I remember a lot of rocks. And we snug down in one night defensive position. It was just had rocks. It, it was not a hilltop, it was in a valley. Uh, there was some sniper fire going on after we settled in. And we weren't quite sure what, we weren't quite sure what it meant. So I finally figured out that they were, that the enemy was trying to find us mm -hmm. by shooting 
well, there must be GIs here somewhere. We'll shoot over here and see if they answer. So I told uh, nobody shot back. I just said, don't, you know, don't, don't shoot back at this. If, we'll call in mortar fire on them. We'll, we'll try to deal with it that way. I don't want you responding to any little sniper shot. And I remember making a, a cracker, cheese, and, and ham slice <laughs> sandwich over a heat tab flame while the sniper rounds were popping here and there. Nothing close. Nothing. I mean, you just heard the, the zing and the... We hunkered down. We settled down that night. Got the next morning. Uh, and we're going to call this morning the 19th. So how many of our days mm -hmm. were dicking around down there looking for graves and looking for underground stuff. And I was moving with uh, 3rd platoon, I wanted to bring 2nd platoon over with me. So I got to CP, moved over to 2nd platoon. This is when Lee says his guys noted that the CP was making a lot of noise. And we probably were. Mm -hmm. and I thought we were being pretty quiet. But that 2nd platoon brought them back to 3rd, moving down the trail. 3rd was leading. 2nd platoon, I was in the middle with 2nd platoon. We're heading toward Piace's position, maybe five, six hundred meters away. And we took a rest stop, and this is when the two NVA came up the side of the trail at sling arms. No helmets, no hats on, just toe-headed kids with khaki uniforms. Mm -hmm. And I shot them. And, uh, and we checked the bodies for intel and whatever they had, we picked that up. And we continued moving on. And that story's in the book. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, not hard to get that information. Linked up with PA, sir. We moved out a little further, made a night defensive position for that night. And the next day is when we moved down further into the valley, uh, when PA found the, uh, the high-speed trail and the wire, tapped the wire. Uh, and on one end of the wire was a division headquarters. The other end was some kind of an artillery regimental headquarters, best we could tell. We, I, now, how I know this is the interpreter, Sergeant Long, uh, Arvin E7, mm -hmm. spoke French, English, Vietnamese, and I had one of the Kit Carson Scots, and we tapped into the wire using the earplugs from the Sony Walkman. That or a transistor radio in those days. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it would, and the guys weren't authorized to have this stuff. I mean, I for, forbade it, uh, but they ignored it because they wanted to hear the music, and so it was a serendipitous violation of my directives. And the uh, and Piazza was smart enough to take an extra handset from a Perk 25 radio and displace, use that to splice into the uh, the wire so that Kid Carson could listen, and they're taking notes. And, what, and the Kit Carson didn't understand English, but he understood Vietnamese, and Long could read his writing and you know, start passing stuff back. So I had double check on the wire as to what was being said. It revealed a, a lot of very interesting information, which we relayed real time up to, up, up to division headquarters through battalion, brigade. And it caught people's attention, because for the first time, somebody on our side was saying what the enemy had on their side, uh, and suspicions were, suspicions were supplanted by something that was more real, mm -hmm. no longer speculation. So a division means what? Four regiments, three regiments, five regiments, it's augmented divisions, mm -hmm. you know, what, what's it got? So three infantry regiments plus a artillery mortar regiment, and we felt later that uh, the division had been augmented with a separate regiment, but we, we, I don't, I don't, somebody else knows mm -hmm. that. The, the records are out, out there somewhere. So how long did you stay with uh, Kamo Wire? About five hours. Uh, during which time, 2nd Platoon had contact with the enemy. 3rd Platoon was farther back behind. 
me just backtrack a little bit so I don't get everybody confused here. We were in company column with platoons leading. Uh, Piesa was in the lead, second platoon was in the middle, third platoon was bringing up the rear. Uh, the valley was broad enough that we didn't have to walk single file. The guys could spread out and provide flank security. The second platoon provided flank security off to the left, the side facing Hill 805, which would have been to the east. They came upon a bluff that dropped down about mm, 70, 80 feet to an intermittent stream below. And it happened to be, uh, it happened to be a pretty good stream at this point for whatever reason. And somebody said, could have been me, it could have been platoon leader, platoon sergeant, oh, this would be a good place for an ambush. Uh, we can see where, and if they come in to get water, this would be a good place for ambush. So I agreed, and second platoon said, I, I halted third platoon. The ASA was moving forward, and the ASA, about that time, got a hold of the wire. And so things were starting to happen all at once. And then a shot rings out. One of the kids in second platoon, a guy named Miller, shot a guy coming down to get water. So just as we suspected. Well, the guy got away. Well, I think I winged him. Uh, Miller was one of these uh, interesting little GIs that you love to talk about. He was a volunteer, regular army, uh, had a little bit of college. He got to Vietnam. Somebody picked him off the airplane and said, you're going to be my clerk. And he was an engineer clerk down in Fubai for a couple months. And he said, but his attitude, his attitude was, I didn't come over here to be an engineer clerk. I came over here to be an infantry soldier and fight the bad guy. And somehow or another, my first sergeant got him to the company. Uh, this, I'd like, I like to pretend that first sergeant traded first sergeant, you know, <laughs> Hey, I've got a clerk down here who wants to fight. What do you give me for? Mm -hmm. <laughs> some some NCO deal happened, and Top called me up and said, I'm sending this guy out. We were on a rally when Miller came out. Mm -hmm. It was a roly-poly little engineer clerk. He'd eaten too well down in Fubai, and uh, he had a few pounds to lose, but he was tough, and he wanted to fight, and he wanted to carry both the M16 and the M79. Mm -hmm. And put him in second platoon, and I said, if you're willing to carry the ammunition, you can carry both weapons. Thinking, okay, that might discourage him, he might just make a decision, be good at one or good at the other. Uh, he got in a little bit of a fisticuff with his uh, foxhole buddy, Ron O'Reilly. Uh, they sorted it out. I came by, noticed a black guy and a cut lip on each of the guys, and I said, what happened here? And uh, neither one of them would confess to what happened slipped on a rock, and so I told Luigi Scog, I said, you got a lot of loose rocks around here, you better make sure your area gets straightened out, and I'll let it go. What are you going to do? So Miller was the guy that winged this fellow. Well, I chastised him a little bit. I just said, well, you got to be a better shot than that if you're going to carry both weapons. You know, I expect you to be able to use both of them. I mean, he worked so hard to get back, to get out in the field, to get mm -hmm. rid of that engineer clerking job. You can just see his whole life had gone down the drain in one, one missed opportunity. Uh, I didn't think much more of it. You know, I didn't beat him up too badly. He didn't like officers anyway, so mm -hmm. I, I, whatever. The interpersonal relationship was 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 okay, but mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to be his friend, and he wasn't trying to be mine. But he missed, and he knew it, and he felt bad about it. Mm -hmm. I turned, he head back down toward Piesa's position, and it wasn't 10 minutes, and another shot rings out, and then a thump gun round goes kaboom. And I run back, there's Miller, <laughs> a shit-eating grin on his face. There's a dead enemy down on a rock. Another guy had come down to get water, and Miller had dropped him with the M16 and planted an M79 round on the guy's chest. He spread eagle down the rock. I said, so what does that tell me? These guys are creatures of habit, and they're coming from two different directions to get water. Because mm -hmm. the guy who got wounded, the one Miller winged, 
whoever, wherever he went, he told the guys, don't come down there, they're shooting at you. Well, where'd this other guy come from? He came from another group of enemy. They weren't coordinating who to go and get, so there were at least two distinct groups of enemy soldiers out there who sent water parties down to that intermittent stream, and we got one of them. Okay, very well. So 2nd platoon held their position, 3rd platoon really was on alert, looking up the back trail, I mean, looking around, we don't know where the hell we were, in the middle of Indian country. The ace is now really cranking up the wiretap. We're starting to get information, and as it develops, as minutes roll into hours, roll into five hours, we start getting information on sort of center of mass location for each of the regimental groups and their quadrants around Ripcord. We get a we get a notion of where the division headquarters is. I get a pretty fair idea. It's up on a Cockney Man Ridge somewhere off to the side a little bit. We get the names of the division political officer, we get the names of some of the regimental staff, commanders, so on and so forth. Just a lot of really good information. Mm -hmm. I can't re recall it all. It gets written down and, and, and eventually all this paperwork made it into the files of division, but mm -hmm. we're talking this over the radio. Right. And we're doing a lot of it in the clear because it's the most expedient way to get it going. The enemy notices that they're losing uh, signal strength on the twisted pair, and they they announce over the over the telephone that they're sending a repair crew out. They've got to coordinate from one end to the other. Uh, I still wonder about that. If they were really trying to send me a signal that they were sending a repair crew out trying scare me off a little bit or what? Anyway, we then increased our preparedness down by the wiretap and we and PS sent guys farther out left and right to shoot anyone who came down the trail where the wire came by. And we made a decision then to arm the guys with captured AKs. And first Wire party comes down the trail and, and we shoot him with an AK, but it doesn't kill him. One guy gets shot square in the chest, he falls down and jumps up. Uh, Sergeant Stuart Ross chases him. Uh, he's off in the woods with, uh, with a blood trail, but you can't find a guy. Now, if we had shot him with the M16, the guy would be dead. There's mm -hmm. no question in my mind, but we didn't. So, uh, But what the hell? Was an AK less lethal or were they just not as good at aiming it? Um, the round doesn't pack the same punch that an M16 does. There is a lot of debate about mm -hmm. it, but the AK rounds that Vietnamese were use, using with the render power. Mm -hmm. And the M16 creates a, it's a higher speed bullet because a hydrostatic shock will blow a bigger hole in you. It, it, it just will. But the idea was to confuse the enemy as to what weapons were being fired. Mm -hmm. the, the sound of firing is very distinctive for each weapon. So we said, okay, well, so much for that. But hold your position. They'll come back. And when they do, fire them up again, rip out as much of the wire as you can, and come on back up the, the ridge line. Which is what happened. The mm -hmm. enemy came back in force looking, looking for us. And, and we ambushed them again. The Acer ripped out 50 meters of wire and came running up the hill. We're in a valley, on a ridge line in the valley, and mm -hmm. the ridge line really isn't very distinguishable except it's the higher. It's higher than the ground left and right of it, but not by much. The Acer got back. We didn't have any more contact with second platoon. We didn't have any more any contact with third. We're all together. see if the enemy is going to come after us. I want to see what, what's going on and I don't want to be all together in a clump when, when he finds us. So I sent, uh, I, I, and I wanted to keep all the platoons together. I didn't want to start spreading guys out. So I had 
PA so lead, followed by second, followed by third, and we sort of fish hooked farther to the west and found a place to set up that was fairly level that we thought we might be able to defend. And I told the platoon leaders and the platoon sergeants that what we're going to do is we're going to sit here at this MDP until it gets closer to dark. And we're going to make noise and we're going to fiddle fuck around as if we didn't care what was going on. In the meantime, we're going to have listening post outposts around where we are. And the listening posts are going to be the guys who get the enemy trying to make a recon on us. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're doing exactly what I say. The guys setting up and they're making noise with tin cups and weapons clean and doing stuff. Staying alert, but they're, they're not being quiet. Meanwhile, the LPOPs are quiet as little mice. There are two guys in each one. And sure enough, shots ring out, and Specialist Jornell and his partner uh, had two NVA couriers, and they killed one of them, and the other guy got away. All right, well, that's two guys who got away this day, but, but two, two more guys down. Then the guy had a, you know, a man bag. He had a pouch with him. He had a courier's pouch. Inside was a map, a French map, French writing on it, a military map, and diagrams showing ripcord and showing arrows and showing, you know, the, mm -hmm. thinking about, you know, maybe a plan of attack and some other stuff. Called this in, and I knew I didn't want to stay in that NDP. I, I didn't want to stay in there in the first place. Mm -hmm. It was just an interim stop. I sent PAs out and I said, you go find a proper NDP. And when you find it, uh, I don't want you to occupy it. I want you to locate it and I want you to be able to come back and have guides bring the other platoon. No, I want you to occupy your sector of it, and I want you to have guides come back and bring the other two platoons into it. But we're going to do this after dark. So if they know you're there during daylight, that's fine. I think one platoon is there, but now after dark, there's going to be three platoons there. But you're going to guide us in. And when you go in there, I want you to pass the place you think is a good NDP and then cut back. So if there's anybody following you, you can catch them. If there's anybody ahead of you, they have to follow you to come back to the NDP. I mean, it's all, they teach you that in mm -hmm. school, shit like that. So after dark, we got moved in and PACE's guides put us in the right place. Everything's fine that night, except for one little thing. Jerry Smith and Randy Baldwin, who were team buddies in 3rd Platoon, set their own little booby trap. They put a hand grenade with a smoke grenade fuse in it inside a sea ration tin. Put a wire and when the enemy came and tripped the wire, pulled the grenade out of the and sea brush, the uh, smoke grenade fuse was only a second and a half so that went down like that. And that little booby trap they left behind, they told somebody about it and somebody told me that it was there but I didn't learn about it until after the fact. It was initiative and I'm not sure if I'd have said do it or not, but it was done, so we, I let it ride. I didn't say go back and disarm it. Mm -hmm. And it blew up about midnight. And I said, oh, my heavens. Somebody's poking around where we just were, just a couple hundred meters, maybe two or three hundred meters away, not very far away. So they're trying to find us. All right, so that's the night of the 20th, 21st. We get up, we go back, look, nobody, for whatever reason, I don't know this for a fact, but somebody apparently doubted the information I was providing the day before. <clears throat> Lucas said, go back, see what you can find down there. Maybe a prisoner. Confirm the information you gave us yesterday. 
Okay, so we've gone from looking for graves. We've got to be killing some of them too. Mm -hmm. They don't believe the information I got from the phone tap. They don't. Mm -hmm. They're not putting any credence in the multiple contacts. They're not connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. And I've got to go get a prisoner. So I send third platoon. It's time for them to go in the lead. So they head, they head down the trail back to where we were from. And no kidding, they run into three guys, and they fire them up, and they kill two. And one gets away. And one of the guys that they kill isn't dead yet, and Doc says, well, maybe maybe we ought to put him out of his misery. And his brains are leaking out of his head. So I said, yeah, go ahead and put him out of his misery. So, so we killed him. We didn't have a prisoner. Mm -hmm. I thought for a minute we might have, but we didn't. At that point, I called the guys back. And I called Lucas, and I said, you know, we we just ran into contact, and I think I can confirm to you that uh, with the courier information and all this other stuff, that you know we got some real stuff out here. So he let he took that. And I'm, in the meantime, everybody up at Ripcord, everybody in battalion headquarters, the other companies, things aren't static. Bravo Company's defending Ripcord. Mm -hmm. Alpha Company's in the field. Uh, Charlie and Delta are somewhere else. Charlie's either on a rally or back in the rear and my classmate Don Workman is in contact on the other side of Hill 805 mm -hmm. and I'm not going to link up with him like somebody had thought to, to do several days prior. I just wasn't going to get there. That, that wasn't the direction mm -hmm. I was going to go anymore. So then I guess on the 21st they were sending Rawlison and Charlie Company out to get, yeah, they had gone out either on the 20th or 21st and they were getting, uh, they were getting Don Workman's company out and then Donnie got killed on the 21st during the extraction. So I'm pretty much by myself uh, and as soon as Rawlison and, and Charlie Company under Ken Lamb now uh, get Workman's company out. There's me and there's Bravo Company, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's some second of the 17 scouts off in the valley somewhere, but there's nobody else in the recording. Yeah. And we know that the Chinook crashed on Ripcord on the 18th mm -hmm. of July, got shot down, and fuel blew up the ammo bunker. We just got, took all kinds of stuff, ran it down on him from that, and we knew that it sounded the death knell for Ripcord. We just didn't know how long it was going to take. Mm -hmm. We could have found stuff before then, but it didn't happen that way. So everybody's busy, and Chuck has to figure out what to do on his own. So I do the same stunt that night as we did the night before, move after dark into an NDP. And we did. And we didn't do much. We didn't do much that day. Uh, I just wanted to stay shy of the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Now, how am I going to get out of Dodge? I don't know what Lucas wants. I don't know what's going on with other activities. I do know that it's that there's a good like he can do two things. He can send in he can get brigade or division to send in more units and we can pile on this enemy mm -hmm. division division. Yeah. And that's all that's a possibility. Or we can get everybody out of Dodge, which is the more likely probability. And if that's going to happen, I need to sort of figure out where to go to keep, keep the guys, keep things together. Got up the next morning, you do your, your, your first light business, you check the perimeter. We don't have any enemy poking around at night, or if we do, we don't notice them. And uh, I send Piesa out, leading the company. To the northwest, to an LZ area that I know about, about 800, 900 meters away, and you got to cross another little intermittent stream to get there. And on the way, they have a intramural firefight with a group from one of the other platoons. And the Kit Carson ended up taking them in a in the circle and got a little bollocked up. But there was a 
nobody got got hurt, but there was a little intramural firefight. So, so okay, everybody settled down. About that time, Luke Lucas called me and said he wanted me to come back to that same LZ just east of Ripcord, and uh, I was getting. We were getting things sorted out after the intramural firefight. It was about 11 o'clock, 10.30. And I was trying to tell Lucas that uh, I didn't want to go where he said to go. He said, come up on secure. We'll talk about came up on secure. He told me where he wanted me to go. I said, sir, that's not tactically sound. And the secure set went dead. Mm -hmm. Those sets were always going dead. That if they would suck up battery power like you wouldn't believe. The batteries wouldn't always be fresh when they came out, or if you mm -hmm. carry them for a long time, they lose their signal, and then the connection connect the connections corroded very easily. Guys were constantly taking rubber or pencil erasers and scraping them off. Went dead. Rather than get try to get it fixed or. And, and we did, and the radio operator tried to rub off the terminals and nothing worked. So we, encu we encrypted the code from the manual shackle code that we had, and one, one letter at a time, and sent that over to clear. Well, by the time we got that shackled up and sent in, Lucas was gone, Tanner was gone, the only people at the talk that were responsible for anything were the radio operator, E5s and E6s. There wasn't an officer in Ripcord to be found in the talk. Mm -hmm. There may have been officers somewhere else. But. So that coded message sat there. And so I'm waiting for a response, and there ain't no response. I say, okay, guys, come on back, Bill, come on back. You take a break. I'm going to send second platoon. We're heading back up to Ripcord. Third platoon, you're going to follow first platoon. I'll be with first platoon after second moves out. You got it? Okay. And guys are going, what? That's, I'm, I'm out, fellas. We just, we just, my decision, we're going up to Ripcord. We got to get up there. Speed is of the essence. Speed is our security. That's, and I knew it was wrong. If I had to take back a decision, that's one of the very few I'd take back in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lee moved out. 150 meters downstream, he got uh, he ran into the right flank of an enemy group that had come around about two thirds of the company, and uh, the battle began. Now Lee remembers it differently from me. I remember us starting the fight. I remember his point team jumping uh, an enemy machine gun nest. He remembers them shooting at us, but that's neither here nor there. That's yeah. all in the that's all in the weeds. As soon as Lee's fight started, and, and he was just out of eyesight, he was just mm -hmm. out of kind, he was far enough away, which which is a good distance to be, the enemy mortars started coming in on us. And there was no time to think about reinforcing Lee. We had a fight on our hands with first platoon, third platoon, and the command post. And the orders were one thing, and, I, and, and then you saw enemy coming out of the bush. I mean, not just, they were attacking, they were in mass, they were, mm -hmm. a bunch of them, you could, some guys were wearing blue pith helmets, maybe they were leaders, guide on me, they were crouching, they were running, and we had guys shooting. Where we lucked up was we were uncoiled, we were in column with formation, we presented maximum weapons broadside to the enemy. If we'd been in a little perimeter, only one third of our weapons could have been facing the enemy assault. But we were linear to their linear, and uh, I, 
I think it worked to our advantage, at least initially. But there were too many of them. We got pushed back. We got isolated. We got cut into into small groups. Uh, I ended up with just me and my two RTOs. Uh, forward observer was killed. Uh, secure set operator was blinded. Forward observer's RTO played dead. Laid over him. Saved saved his life. That was a long day for that. Playing dead for six seven hours until they came back into the perimeter. I don't, I don't necessarily need to go over everything that's in the book. I know you want to have this on, on tape. But most of you kind of want to follow your story and yeah. what you see and what you experience. So yeah. Kind of. Well, the, the, a lot of things happened at once. I noticed that the, that the mortar barrage included chemical shells, uh, CS, mm -hmm. tear gas shells. Some, not all, some. Uh, a lot of them burst in treetops, so they had, uh, they didn't have delay fuses, they had... Contact fuses or something. Yeah, contact fuses but it hit the treetops. We got a lot of, a lot of splinters shower, showering down on us. Some made it through the trees and burst in the earth. Uh, they were 82 millimeter mortars, they had a different sound than the, than the 60s. 82, I figured, probably a battalion. All this stuff runs through your head. Mm -hmm. And then you saw the guys coming out of the woods, out of the brush, and you heard your guys firing. And your ne my next reaction was to get a good sight picture and start killing. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I did that, I remembered, I remember what Dick Ames told me. Your job is on the radios. I also realized that as soon as I fired, I'd become a target. So I grabbed two radio guys, Whit and Vic, and I said, we're going over there. And I hollered to the CP, I said, they gave him a direction, I gave him a distance, and we ran 75 meters or so over to this, this area where we could sort of get some cover, concealment, a little bit of cover. And they kept shooting RPGs at us, and we kept moving Okay, move five feet this way. And Vic is taking down the, he's the battalion operator, he's taking down the long pole, he's putting up the long pole, he's taking down the long pole, putting up. He said, God damn it, stay in one place. <laughs> I said, you're right, you're right, you're right. Got to have the radios. Radios got to work. We got to take a chance. And the radios are what, you know, get the Cobras and the artillery. And I didn't know Olson was dead, but, the, but Olson and I had worked at it and a, a procedure where I would take Cobras and fast movers and he would handle artillery. That was his primary job was mm -hmm. to get indirect fire assets and I would take care of the, 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 the jets and the, and the Cobras. I got battalion talk on the, on the horn. Again, it was an NCO up there. It wasn't anybody else. John Penfold, who I knew, and I he said, I got a problem and I need you to get me some, some stuff. Cobras, get me some Cobras. And there just happened to be a flight of Cobras coming out from Camp Evans on another mission. And Penfold got them diverted. And the Cobras came up on my push, on my radio frequency, and within, within minutes, it's eight minute flight time from Evans, and they were, they were with me three minutes after first shots were fired. Mm -hmm. I mean, just and I had to, I knew where Lee was pretty well, but I, you know, how do you, usually we just pop smoke. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't have combo with Lee. All his, his radios had been fucked up. One had been destroyed, another one was out of commission, and it could be fixed maybe. And I didn't have any radio combo with him. Third, the rest of third and, and first didn't have any radio combo. They were all busted up, but I sort of knew where guys were, so I had to guess. I made a pretty good guess. I knew how we were supposed to be laid out. And I tried to describe that to the Cobra guys, 
and the only position I could mark was mine, so I marked it. Well, that was a blessing and a curse. You know, as soon as I marked it, here come the RPGs for the fourth or fifth time. But you know, you, you accept that. And I told him from that smoke, you know, 150 meters up that way, I've got friendlies, and 50 meters here, and 100 meters down here. Well, I'm going to miss some guys. I'm going to miss something. One of my guys got killed by a Cobra rocket strike. I don't know that that's in the book, but Brown, who was firing a machine gun, stayed forward. He was, I believe he was with 1st Platoon. He stayed forward, and a Cobra rocket buried itself in his back. He was doing more damage to the enemy than, uh, than anyone else at that point. So. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't find out until years later. The Cobra fire was generally effective. I finally got Weegis Gog to talk to me verbally. He finally popped smoke to sort of mark his position. He was having his own time. He was uh, surrounded on three sides and eventually surrounded on four sides. The enemy was throwing satchel charges completely over his perimeter. They were so close. Uh, Third platoon and, and first platoon, little clusters of men. They'd, they'd have an enemy hiding behind a tree on one side of a bush that the a GI would be, you know, they'd be looking out at each other and somebody trying to draw a bead on you. And the, the whole thing just became personal, it became one one on one little fights or two on one or three on two or whatever. Cut it shorter. I got done being scared. And I was really afraid. And I was afraid for a lot of things. And not just your life, it's not just getting shot. I was afraid. Do I have to break up the company into groups of two and three and exfiltrate? You know, what mm -hmm. how do I get out of this? And there didn't seem to be an answer. And I have never been without an answer before. So that's that's a little tough. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had resources that, I, that I, was, I would have to use. And those resources, in terms of support from the air, and then I could get the troops together on the ground, I would have to do this. I, I understood what had to be done. And after about 20 minutes, the Cobras had been working for me, and they seemed to be effective. Um, I realized that if I worked it right, I could pull us through this thing, but it was going to take a lot of a lot of effort and part of air support. And I talked to battalion talk. I asked about artillery support. If they had, if, are you firing anything for me? No, we're not in contact with your Fox Oscar. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'll be the, I'll, from now on. I'm your Fox Oscar. I'll fire your artillery. I need to do that to the fire direction center up there. You have to relay for me. So we have a battalion talk. Again, no officers up there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're gone to the rear to plan the withdrawal for yeah. the following day. So I have an NCO who's competent and very good at what he does and has spent six months at least in the field and he's been in firefights and he knows this stuff and he's the guy who has to coordinate with the Cobras, with the air, forward air controllers, with the artillery. And I get artillery cranked up and it comes in where I say to put it. Um, fast movers are coming on station. It's about the time the Cobras break off, uh, the forward air controller, their call sign was Bill, Bill 3-4, guy named Skip Little Major. Uh, what do you got down there? And Skip is a great guy. He can visualize the battlefield the same way I do. His, his head gets inside mine, and I tell him what I've got. I tell him how we're laid out, and I I said, I'm cranking up artillery, it's coming from here, it's going to land there. So stay out of the way. Bring your fast movers, I will clear a priority lane of fire for you, know, north to south, going straight in toward Ripcord. If you come in between 805 and the Cockmillan Ridge, where it runs out, you come right up that valley, you'll be perfectly positioned to drop ordnance on you. And what I want is 250-pound high drags and, and napalm. The smallest you got. 
He said, well, my first set has got 1,000 pounders. I said, 1,000 pounders way too big. I can't, I, I can't use that. And I, I said, wait a minute. I know where the division headquarters is. <laughs> I said, son of a bitch, put, you know, I, I told him on a map. And you can sort of pick these places out. If you start thinking like they do, you can say, well, if I were down, where would I put it? And I asked Skip to look at the wood lines, if there were any cleared areas, number one. Look at the wood lines next to the cleared areas on the slopes of the Cockmoman Ridge Line. If he could see anything that looked like fresh dirt or fresh camouflage, or maybe dead camouflage. And he spotted a place that he figured was as good a candidate as any. I said, well, put your thousand pound bonds right there. And he reported secondary explosions. So yay. Maybe that did something for us. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And he came back with 250 pounds of napalm and stuff. And the Cobras came back. And now you've got you've got this priority lane for the fast movers. You've got the artillery coming in and you can't fly through the artillery fire. And that's coming from a couple mm -hmm. of different bases. And you still want your Cobras to work, but they can be effective a thousand meters away. So you give them orbital patterns over here and over here so they can shoot at the bad guys and still leave space. Just don't cross in front of the jets. You've got to be careful, guys. Skip knows this. I know this. We create a three-dimensional battle space that we can move forward in time. And now the enemy's blocked by artillery. He can't reinforce and he can't get away. And if I can squeeze him between artillery and airstrikes, and if I can pick him off with the Cobras, then all I got to do is get my guys back up to where we were and pull back together. And I've won, or I've su survived, or yep. I've succeeded better than this guy. And it takes all afternoon to do this. But eventually we do. And the hard part eventually then became, I need the bombs and napalm closer than you're allowed to drop them. Danger close was 500 meters, and Skip wouldn't, was not allowed to drop it closer than that. I said, you, 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 I mean, you got to, man. You, I mean, you just got to do it. Mm -hmm. And we had this little back and forth, and he wasn't being an asshole about it. He was just saying, hey, I'll do my best. And he'd fudge it close. I said, don't fudge it. Bring it in. Put it right there. Finally, he did. I don't. He he always pretended it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. He always pretended it was an error. But uh, I think it was very deliberate, and it worked. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody in the company will tell you when that bomb hit, the battle was over. The guys, the enemy was either destroyed or stunned or running away. We shot a lot of guys in the back. But the battle wasn't quite over because we moved back to our original position. Some idiot with an RPG fired and it hit a tree branch or something in front of me and it burst and it caught me in the neck with a, with a, a bit of the jet from the shape charge. Caught some of the other guys. Nobody was killed but we were all again filled up with metal fragments and the, the little jet stream had to go through my neck because I was wearing religious medals, it broke the broke the chains that were holding them around my neck. You can still see the where the hole came out. And that jet just missed it followed soft tissue and missed all the hard tissue. That's the only thing I can think of. It flipped me up in the air and turned me upside down. I landed on my ass and I thought I was dead. Went, Lee had a working radio by this time. I went, I went to call him and turn the company over to him. Uh, and I realized I wasn't going to die. And so that was sort of the last shot fired. But it's gotten late in the day by this time, hasn't it? Yeah, it's pushing five, five o'clock, five thirty. 
bad guys know where you are, you can't stay there. Yeah, but there's no bad guys immediately available to come after us. We've bought some time. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have destroyed our immediate tormentors. There might may be guys coming behind them, but mm -hmm. we don't know. I was told during the battle that there was a second battalion on its way to, to come at me. And I cavalierly told the NCO that they could wait their turn. Uh, during, the, during the fight, I handed the handset to one of the radio operators while I killed an enemy guy that was over on, night def on our defensive position. It was one of those shots you can't fail to take uh, because it was too easy. But it was also necessary because he was point he had an RPG at his shoulder and was getting ready to fire a sucker. So and the RTO talks to his buddy up at Tuck and he says, Oh, the old man just killed another one. Another one? You know, it's my first one today. Thank you for that. Nighttime's coming on. We do a head count. You know, it's really miserable. Two guys are missing. Uh, I know some guys are dead because I've learned that as, as clusters pull together. As guys from 1st and 3rd join my CP during the course of a five-hour battle. Oh, the lieutenant's dead. I saw him go down. This, the singleton's dead. I saw him go down. He got shot with a machine gun. Okay, well, you know, we don't have that. Well, Brown got hit. Bixby's, you know, we lost two medics. Um, so you want to find out who you got left who can fight, because you're going to have to do this again pretty soon. You don't know when, but you think pretty soon. I counted 20 guys who could pull triggers out of 75 men, 74 men and myself. I counted 20 guys that I had confidence could form a perimeter. Say 20. From 75, that leaves you about 55 guys that are either dead or wounded. Mm -hmm. And they got to go somewhere. And they can't go inside a 20 man perimeter. So they go outside. You can't call in medevacs. Nobody, nobody's going to, in their right mind, is going to come in at dusk after a firefight like that. And I'm not. Going to call them. You know, I'm not going to be responsible for getting a medevac shot mm -hmm. down. So the wounded guys are going to have to do the best they can. And they're going to have to do it outside the perimeter because the guys who can fight are going to be inside the larger company perimeter where the wounded guys are. That was my decision. That's all I could think of to do. And, it, and you can coordinate sectors of fire and you can say, okay, you've got some wounded guys to your front. You know, try not to shoot them when the enemy comes back. But if the enemy comes back, your job is to shoot the enemy. And if you happen to hit one of our guys and it's the middle of it's midnight and there's no light, I mean, you, you get the idea. Yeah. They got the idea. They understood that. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, we had illumination flares being dropped from um, CH-47s all night long. They called them basketballs. They would hang up there for a couple minutes, get a good burn. Are we getting close on? No, well, just, just keep going. We'll as long as we need to, we're fine. So, and I kept the strobe light going so that when we had constant overhead co cover, I put a strobe light on a, on a pole, and the covers could look at that strobe light and know where our center of mass was. Mm -hmm. And if we had any problems, they could go from that strobe light, and I would say 50 meters, 100 meters, whichever direction, and they'd be able to provide cover. So I had two Cobras on station all night long. I had basketball flares coming from Chinooks all night long. And it was the best we were going to do. We, we, we got a call from battalion at Rollison and Delta Company, our Delta Company, were going to come to the landing zone that, ironically, I had been trying, I had wanted to go to initially. But they couldn't get in at last light because the preparatory fires on the landing zone ignited some trees and there was a lot of, a lot of burning going on. Somebody dropped some napalm in, in part of the hill. They couldn't get in. <coughs> so they would have to come in next morning. So we knew we had to hang on until next morning. 
Um, and, and you know that first light means that's when they get on the ground, it's not when they get to you. So did anybody bother you that night? No. They stayed away. Okay. I don't understand it. Except that you and they had been chased off, and if you maybe had hit their headquarters, there was no one to make a new plan. I don't know. Jim, that's wonderful speculation. Yeah, but that's I mean, all it, it is. <laughs> it's, but it, it's, it, but it's, it, it's all soup for the analysis, mm -hmm. and I don't know what, where that analysis yeah. goes. What you do know is that nobody else came. Nobody else came. Night. The only incident was we had some mortar illumination. They still had mortars on ripcord. Mm -hmm. And they fired some illumination rounds for us. And one of the uh, an illumination rounds popped. There's a little donut ring that pops out to help separate the canister from the parachute. And that donut ring continues on the original trajectory of the round. The, the base of the round falls away, the parachute floats, and the donut ring continues, and it makes a little <whistles> sound. And you can, and they crash through the trees, and one of them. They started coming into the perimeter, and one of them hit our friend Miller in the helmet. Now, it's only about a, a half a pound of metal, mm -hmm. but you hear it whopping in there, and you hear it clang, and you hear somebody curse. And I went down there, and I said, oh, shit, please, please don't let anybody be hurt. And it was Miller, and he got a cut down the side of his face. It wasn't, wasn't great. And he looked up at me and said, God damn, son of a bitch, I've been fighting all day, I haven't got one wound. He fought with his M16, that was shot out of his hands. He fought with his M79, that was shot out of his hands. He picked up a captured enemy AK-50, the folding stock version of 47. He killed seven enemy with their own weapon. Mm -hmm. He was one of the, one of the killer angels of that, uh, of that battle, one of the heroes. And that son of a bitch got no scratch on him until that D-ring hit him on the damn head. And oh, he was angry. He wanted to go up and get somebody. I said, calm down, I got it shifted, everything's going to be fine. So maybe he was getting back at me for chastising him mm -hmm. a couple of days earlier. But uh, We made it through the night. Rollison uh, got on the ground the next morning. They had contact, we could hear it, we could hear some some shots, he just bowled his way through. Enemy was not organized enough to offer him resistance, which probably tells you why they weren't organized enough mm -hmm. to come after me. Um, he got close, he called me on the radio and said, Hawk, tell me how to get to you. And I said, uh, I fired some shots in the air, three shots, home in on those, do it again, do it again. He said, man, I'm having trouble locating. I said, just follow the bodies. And his point man found the first body and he said, well, sure, this could be easy. We'll just follow them up. You know, just, we'll walk the dead bodies into his position. And Sid Berry told me later on, he was over in his chopper, he heard that comment and he said, I thought you were talking about U.S. bodies. Now, up until that point, up until that previous night when Lucas finally got back to the firebase and saw this encrypted message, did anyone have an idea of what I'd been through? Except the NCOs doing the work yeah. to get the, the, the support. And now Barry had an idea for the first time and he thought it was U.S. bodies and of course it turned out not to be and he learned that very, very quickly. He stayed out of the way but he monitored. So Rollison got there shortly thereafter, and he said, uh, "He said, Hawk, how many effectives you got?" And I said, "About 20." He said, "Put them out on the perimeter." He said, uh, "We're going to blow an LZ here. That's Lieutenant's work. Flaherty, you go over there and you get this LZ squared away. Grab whoever Hawk's people you got that you need. Put the rest of them out on the perimeter." You guys make this LZ happen. Do it now. Hawk, you're bleeding. We're going to have some coffee. And so he sat me down and we, hit, we brewed up some coffee and, and I 
and he told me Don Workman had been killed the day, the two day, the day before, two days before. Uh, and we built the, uh, they started blowing down trees. C4, when the C4 was out, they used light anti-tank weapons. Jack Flaherty still has ringing in his ears from using laws to blow down trees. We got toward the end of the LZ, the tree cutting part, and I said, that's not going to work. You're going to have to build a log stanchion, a log platform to let the choppers guide on and set down. Mm -hmm. So we built, a, we built a log platform about six or seven logs high. And that allowed the, the and put a layer of logs on top, and that allowed the choppers to focus on where to get down. They could mm -hmm. sort of get a level place. They didn't have to worry about avoiding stumps. Mm -hmm. We could get dead guys and wounded guys up there on litters, get them on the choppers. And uh, we didn't have too much trouble getting guys out. Uh, we, we organized the chocks for extraction, but some of the guys were a little gun shy and they wanted to, they broke ranks and got on choppers earlier than they should have and, and Ross had said, just don't worry about it, you can't let them go, somebody else. Most of the guys cooperated, most mm -hmm. of the guys worked out, uh, somebody went early, somebody took their place later. Uh, didn't happen much, but it did, didn't happen, I mean, human nature being what it is. Tape is now. All right, so we've got gotten to the point where you are now using helicopters and getting your company uh, out of there. Yeah, we we've, we've pretty pretty much got it handled. There, yeah. there was a couple of guys broke ranks, not to worry. Uh, the last two or three choppers we're going to take primarily Delta Company. We started integrating Delta mm -hmm. and Alpha Company guys. Toward the end, mm -hmm. all the Alpha Company guys are out, Delta Company guys are gone, but there's a handful of Alpha Company guys to go, and I, I said, I'll go on the last chopper, and mm -hmm. Ross and said, bullshit, you know, get on, you know, just get out of here. We left a lot of equipment behind, I worried about that, and he said, we'll call it an airstrike afterward, just do not worry about it. Okay, fine. So I got on the third to last chopper with my RTOs and a couple of Delta guys, and then Rollison and his guys got on the last two come, coming out. And uh, we made it back. I found out from Randy House, who was the flight lead, that they were actually flying underneath the guns of enemy machine gunners on the ridge line. Mm -hmm. They dug in their machine guns to shoot at ripcord, and helicopters coming in ripcord, and they didn't have the time or effort or they didn't depress the barrels. They couldn't. They couldn't depress the barrels, and they didn't want to dig out to depress them because that would expose them. So House was able to fly under their guns. We drew some fire the last few choppers, but very little, and it was wasn't effective. And I don't know if it was coming from ridge lines or a couple of guys out in the, on the ground. Anyway, we got uh, we got out of there. Mm -hmm. Nobody was shot down, everybody choppered down to our little LZ and picked off. And it wasn't some it was not something you flew into. You had to hover and come straight down and mm -hmm. come straight up. And so it took time and there was a lot of exposure. And those uh, helicopter pilots, every one of them came straight down that, that channel and went straight back up. So uh, we got back to the rear, early afternoon, big welcoming party. But didn't know you guys were going to make it. Mm -hmm. And here's Rollison, who's gone out, how many how many different times has he gone out to save somebody's ass? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the next chapter in that story. And we get back to the rear, and then that's when, I, that's when he, that's when I find out, that's when he tells me that not only did my classmate Don Workman get killed, but Lucas was killed that mm -hmm. morning on Major Tanner. And Rollison really loved Lucas. They were, Rawson was Lucas's favorite mm -hmm. commander, and there's no two ways about it. Rawson would do anything for Lucas. Uh, it was just there was a bond there that went beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was all over. Yeah. But 
Uh, now, did you have to spend any time in the hospital with your injury, or was that no. minor enough that they just bandaged you and moved on? Now, the battalion XO Davis took me down ostensibly to see my troops at 85th Vac down in Fubai. And while I was there, he hustled me into an x ray room and had me x rayed. And there were maybe 50 different pinpoints of metal show up. And the doc said, you know, if we operate, he'll look worse than he does right now. Most of it will grow out. Most of it will work its way out over time. But there's nothing life-threatening and nothing duty-threatening. He can go he can go back. And I, Davis, he tricked me into coming down here to see my guy just so he could get me x-ray. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not going to run around. I did have one guy die in the hospital from his wounds, Neil. But uh, it was tough. One guy was paralyzed forever from the waist down. Rick Eisen lived in Colorado, died a few years ago. It was just not easy. No one, uh, no one, what these guys had to go through, but they went through it. And they had a tough spirit. And when Rawlinson's guys came in, they uh, they recognized that we'd been in a fight, but they also recognized that we were we still had something left. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful for that because the something left ended up a week later being nine veterans of Ripcord, nine veterans of that set of '74, mm -hmm. going out with uh, with 20 new. 30 new, 30 new guys at a 39-man company. I had nine-man platoons, three nine-man platoons, so, you know, in the, in the CP. Now, gradually, guys came back. Mm -hmm. Some came back to duty in the field. Uh, the wounds were not that bad. Some came back to duty in the rear because they'd had enough time in the field. Randy Baldwin and Jody Smith became my two radio operators. Uh, Witt and Vic were given rear jobs. Uh, yeah, so things changed. We had a whole new company, basically. Mm -hmm. Got new platoon leaders in. We just got it was the only you know, consistent thread. And you know, almost almost overnight, he became the old the old pro. Right. He was, uh, he was the go-to guy. Anything I ever needed, ever again, I could go to him and get it. And how much longer did you spend with commanding a company? Uh, August, September, October, and most of November. Okay. Uh, and was there much going on at that point, or was it more just patrolling? It became, it became quieter. I think we were our battalion was deliberately put into an area that was not quite as active. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I have to say that Alpha Company continued to perform well. We continued to engage the enemy more than other companies. We continued to kill more of the enemy. Uh, we had some pretty good operations during that time, but nothing like Ripcord, nothing right. like the, You know, the best we might do is nail three or four guys in a rice carrying party mm -hmm. or something like that, or <clears throat> catch some fellas in a with artillery or right. whatever. And where were you operating now? Still Most, in the hills or? Still in the hills. We're still beyond Rocket Ridge, but we're a lot, we're, 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 we, we initially began operating around a fire base named Catherine, mm -hmm. uh, which is also near a fire base named Marine. We operated out there for a couple months and then we gradually pulled back and we operated around a fire base called Rockasan. Rockasan was close enough to the coast, it was still beyond Rocket Ridge, but it was close enough to the coast that there was a road that went all the way from there to Camp Evans. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a, they wanted it to be a year-round fire base because of that road, and it was. But it, it was tough in the monsoon season to, to operate there. Now did they eventually rotate you into a staff job? 
I became the battalion adjutant, the S-1, the personnel officer, on November 19, 1970. A guy named Sam Wrightson took over the company. He had been the, uh, the, the S-1, so we just swapped mm -hmm. positions. And uh, so for December and January and most February until I went home, I was a battalion adjutant, mm -hmm. which was fine. During which time, the Bravo Company commander, Jensen, went on R&R &R and the battalion commander asked me to be the Bravo Company commander. So I was Bravo Company commander for the period that this guy was on R&R, &R, one week plus mm -hmm. travel time. We were working the lowlands in, so I can I can also say that uh, I've commanded every company in the battalion except headquarters company and Delta company and Echo company. So I've commanded A, B, and C. C yep. One reason point or another. All right. Uh, now, when your tour of Vietnam comes to an end, how much longer do you stay in the army on active duty? I stayed on active duty until September of 1977, at which point I resigned my commission. I was uh, a staff officer at the Major Command at Fort McPherson, and I was seeking other opportunities outside the Army. I, the Army had gone through several reductions in force at that time. They were getting rid of uh, you know, reserve officers as well as uh, regular Army officers. Mm -hmm. I kept finding myself in the bottom third of my peer group couldn't quite fight my way up into the great gray middle. But I said, well, there's no future here, and it's unlikely I'll command a battalion, so uh, time for me to look for something else. Stayed in the Army Reserve, served, uh, <clears throat> I served with an Army Reserve training unit at Fort Gillum, Georgia, for a couple of years until I was uh, notified by a friend at the 1st Battalion, 121st Infantry, Georgia National Guard needed a company commander down in Thomaston, Georgia, and they needed a Bravo company commander. And so I went down and talked to the battalion commander who was the general manager of one of the tire, uh, one of the belted radial tire mills down there, and he said, Billy, Billy Phillips, and he said, yeah, I need a company commander. I said, Bravo company can't seem to keep a company commander. I've had five in the last four years. I said, well, I'll hang around a while, but you got to make, you know, at some point you've got to make me a major and bring me up into operations. And he said, oh, we'll, we'll do that. So I commanded that company for three years, uh, which was some pretty good guys. Mm -hmm. We had fun there. We went to annual training. <clears throat> when did I take, well, whatever. I took over. I realized that these guys needed somebody to help them spell army. As much as you like the guard, the guard is needs a little bit of leadership. So I said, you got to pass the PT test, guys. That's the main thing you do. I mean, next next month we'll talk about shooting a rifle. You got to get in shape. You got to you got to pass the PT test. And they had three or four months to get in shape to do that. I knew they wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. We went down there and we took the PT test, and 55% of the company passed the PT test. Now, I'm, I'm used to having a 98% yeah, pass yeah. rate on active, active duty, right? Mm -hmm. And my challenge was, if your squad doesn't pass, if 75% of your men don't pass, I'm going to get rid of you. If you don't pass, I'm going to get rid of you. Well, I can't do that. Yeah. But The nearest company to my company in taking a PT test was 35%. One third of the guys passed mm -hmm. the PT test. Two thirds are out of, too much out of shape to pass the damn thing. The tank commander comes over to me and I said, wow, your company really looks great. I said, sir, 55% is barely, it's that's, nothing. It's still enough. I said, every one of these guys that fails is ha ha has to retake the test before Christmas. Or, or I'm going to, the term I use is put them on waivers. I'm trying to speak mm -hmm. football. You know, I'm going to put you on waivers. And it wasn't a game. I was serious about it. But I eventually got everybody past the test. Anyway, the Georgia Guard treated me well. I moved up to 
Virginia later on, became a member of the Virginia Guard. Uh, that's where I retired out of in 92. Uh, okay. And did you have a civilian career as well? Yeah, I worked computers down in Atlanta. Uh, when I came up to Virginia, I was brought up to work for a computer company called Sperry Univac, which had computers in the White House that mm -hmm. provided digital communications for the president. So I worked at the White House Communications Agency for a couple of years as a contractor. Uh, after that, I moved on to higher speed you know, computing uh, machines. <clears throat> and at some point along the way, I met I met a small firm that did defense work uh, and did military uh, military history research and used data from history to actually help develop models of combat, simulations of combat, force-on-force mm -hmm. -force simulations. Uh, basically an operations research arena using historical data to populate the, uh, uh, the models that we used. It was uh, it was interesting work and it got me uh, got me exposed to uh, to a different way of doing business. I ended up uh, I ended up being the senior VP and then the president of a small, very small beltway firm. But during this period, I got exposed to China for the first time. And subsequently, I've spent over two years in China doing uh, work for the US government on over 50 trips and have become one of the fellows that the Defense Department calls on to try to understand the relationships between China and North Korea. I've spent maybe over a dozen trips up to the frontier. I don't go to North Korea. I probably wouldn't come back if I did, but I am easily welcomed by the Chinese mm -hmm. to look at North Korea from their side. They're as concerned about North Korea as as other people are, but for different reasons. Right. And and they welcome having an American who has the ear of people in the Defense Department so they can tell their story to him. Mm -hmm. It's like throwing wet toilet paper up against the wall. Some of it's going to stick. <laughs> and some of it does. It takes time. But the Chinese have a perspective that we find valuable. And it's uh, it's helpful in our, in our defense planning mm -hmm. to know alternatives to Chinese thinking such issues as North Korea, Korean unification, Korean stability, Korean right. economics, and so on and so forth. And so I've seen a lot of changes up there, and, and I keep going back and I keep looking at things and trying to figure out what, what it all means. Mm -hmm. All right, so the, really the military has kind of threaded through pretty much your whole life on a lot oh, yeah. of different levels. Uh, and there. Okay, well, it makes a remarkable story. I know there's probably an assortment of dimensions we haven't even gotten into, but uh, for our purposes here, you've done a great job, and I overworked you thoroughly. So thank you very much for coming yeah. to the chair today. You're certainly welcome. All right.